So uh, we are talking about Vladimir Sorokin, Vladimir Georgievich Sorokin, who indeed uh, has turned uh, 50, uh, 65, sorry, uh, this year. Um, and um, um, I assume that, 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 that you know uh, about him and you have read his major works and I'm not going to, to read his biography. I just put this slide on the screen so that you could review whatever uh, is interesting for you. But, but uh, what, is, what is strange for me, I have been writing about Sorokin for, for many years. Um, and um, he always was among the um, sort of experimental uh, group of writers who are by default considered to be young ones. Uh, and now he's 65. And uh, I just, just for, the, for the comparison checked uh, uh, Tolstoy's timeline and uh, Tolstoy 65 is in his late phase and he has already written all his major novels. I, I hope that it's not the case of, uh, of Sorokin. He is, he's in the excellent uh, working form and uh, I'm pretty sure that, that he will do many other incredible things uh, in the future, but uh, it still um, invites certain reflections on the path that he, had, uh, he has come uh, by today and what he has achieved already as the writer and as a thinker, I would dare say. Uh, so uh, just, just, just uh, simple and uh, very much imprecise statistics. Uh, we can say that, that, that he, uh, uh, by today, uh, he is the author of um, 13 novels, right? And you can see their list. Uh, I didn't list The Month and the How because I don't think it's a novel. I think it's a, a long story or novella. Right, uh, then he uh, authored six collection of short prose. And, and uh, although the fonts uh, here are smaller than on the previous uh, uh, slide, I want to emphasize that I think that, that Sorokin's short prose is as important, maybe even more important than his novels. In fact, in fact, he uh, uses his short prose as the lab for his novels and uh, typically some radical turn in his work happens after the uh, collection of new short stories, right? And you can, you can see it uh, uh, by, by, by comparing the dates of the novels and the dates of his uh, short stories. So he, he uses uh, short stories to test new grounds, to test new Effects. Not all of them would go into the novels, but what happens is that all his novels typically, with the exception probably of one uh, or two, consist of short stories. They, 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 they are easily broken into the episodes uh, that may be pretty separate from each other. Uh, and um, these uh, short stories, uh, they constitute the, the sort of... Uh, uh, plot of the novel, but basically it is uh, the novel in novellas, right? And that's, that's uh, Sorokin's peculiar response to the uh, time when, when the novel is in decline as a genre, when, uh, as we know, the, the, the novel requires the time uh, when synthesis can be done. And uh, uh, Sorokin's time is the time of analysis, the time of disintegration of uh, previously existing monolithic constructions in culture and society. So right, just right now, he published the most uh, um, idiosyncratic book, Russian Folk Proverbs and Idioms. Of course, all these Russian Folk Proverbs and Idioms are composed by Vladimir Georgievich Sorokin. Yeah. And I can only wonder what, what new turn it promises in his uh, prose. But uh, Sorokin is not only a prose writer, as you can see, he is a very much prolific playwright. Uh, and uh, it is an amazing fact that we do not recognize him as a playwright, although he had created multiple dramas which are very dynamic and which combine his uh, linguistic uh, experimentation with the stunning uh, visual imagery, right? And no wonder uh, that um, from plays, uh, only a few of them have been produced, by the way, 
uh, he moved uh, to uh, the films and uh, he wrote several film scripts and you can see that at least four films have been based on his um, scripts. He also is working in the strange uh, genre of, uh, okay, not strange, traditional, great genre, uh, fantastic genre, but very rare, uh, rarely explored by contemporary uh, writers, genre of opera librettos. Uh, we all remember a uh, famous uh, production of Rosenthal Children at uh, the stage of Bolshoi Theater and music of Leonid Desiatnikov. But his uh, recent uh, book uh, that is titled Triumph Vremeni Bischustria, if you can see it, um, it, it uh, has three more librettos and uh, I don't remember seeing any, any significant critical reflection of Sorokin's work in this genre. Uh, so Sorokin is, is much larger than, than what we know about him and uh, it is uh, a little wonder that, that he is uh, steadily getting into the English language market. Uh, so you can see the list of his books that have already been translated into, into English and uh, the majority of them have been translated by the late uh, Jamie Gambrell, uh, who tragically died last year. But um, to my knowledge, there are at least three new uh, books uh, that are being translated as we speak and hopefully they will be uh, published soon, and they're being translated by young and talented uh, translators, Max Lawton and Anna Aslanya. Um, no wonder also that, that the, the, the writer of this uh, scale and scope uh, draws the attention of scholars, right? And there are several, I, I will show only a few few scholar publications uh, about Sorokin. So we see uh, one of the first, if not the first volume about Sorokin appeared in 1999, uh, and it was edited by Dagmar Burkhardt. Um, uh, then in the 2010s, uh, uh, Tina Rosen and Dirk Kufelman first ran the first conference, no, no, I'm sorry, second conference on Sorokin and published uh, the volume Vladimir Sorokin's Languages. And then um, Evgeny Dabrenko, Ilya, Kalinin and me, we collected the volume Prosto, at a Prosto book for Nabumagi. Vladimir Sorokin, Post Literature, these are only letters on paper. Vladimir Sorokin, After Literature, where we collected uh, articles from other volumes that haven't been translated into Russian and commissioned a lot of new articles and that, that has been published uh, in 2018. And uh, a few months ago, uh, Academic Studies Press, the same uh, Academic Studies Press uh, that uh, um, is also playing an important role in the Borderline School, uh, published uh, the first English language monograph about Sorokin. Dirk Ufelman uh, wrote this monograph. Uh, it's a companion, William Sorokin's Discourses, and you can see it's a table of content uh, where, where each chapter is dedicated to uh, one of uh, Sorokin's uh, novels. And uh, it, 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 it provides really a very important guide to, to, to Sorokin's oeuvre. And I believe that, that now uh, Sorokin will be much more open for the next wave and the next level of critical interpretations coming from our students uh, and from uh, younger scholars, uh, and not probably not only in Slavic studies. And, and by the way, here on the cover, uh, Dirk used uh, the painting by Sorokin, and Sorokin, as you uh, know, has been working as a graphic designer since his youth, and now he's, he returned to painting and produces a number of visual images. Certainly this, this, this survey of his uh, work and works about him is incomplete. I, I missed quite quite a few other works, but I, I think it gives you the feel of uh, the, 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 the scope of Sorokin and the scope of his, of his work and his imagination. So, uh, so what is very important about Sorokin is that he uh, primarily um, works with the not by, so, so as you know, there are, there are writers who, who 
invent their worlds basing on stories. And there are writers who uh, invent their words basing on words and language. So Sorokin definitely belongs to the latter category, right? And his um, experimentation uh, begins in the late 70s uh, within the circle of Moscow conceptualists. Uh, and in certain ways, many ways, he is faithful to uh, the path that he had selected back then. Um, I, I wrote about this and, and I apologize before those who, who are familiar uh, with, with my article on this subject, but I'm going to, to use some of its ideas and then, then uh, move a little forward. Uh, so I believe that, the, and uh, here I'm summarizing um, ideas that have been expressed by many scholars, um, dear Kushelman uh, included and to many others. Uh, I have introduced the, the, the term carnalization, which is from the Latin carnalis, flesh of carnal. And uh, uh, my idea, as I said, not, not incredibly original, is that this is uh, Sorokin's own distinctive method of deconstruction that he uh, applies to authoritative discourses, symbols, and cultural narratives. Right. Um, and uh, the, the nature of this uh, discourse is quite simple. He transforms verbal concepts into corporeal images or translates discursive implications and rhetorical presuppositions into a language of bodily gestures, right? We, sometimes it's called the literalization of metaphors, but <clears throat> I, I think that Sorokin goes uh, further than just literalizing uh, metaphors. He gives them flesh, he gives them body, he, he uh, makes uh, language corporeal, right? And uh, uh, that's, uh, he, he is very much reflective of this uh, principle, of this uh, central device of his prose, for instance, he, he said back in 1996, more than a quarter century ago, I work constantly with liminal zones where the body invades the text. For me, this borderline between literature and corporeality was of foremost importance. As a matter of fact, my texts always raise a question of literary corporeality and I try to resolve the problem whether literature is corporeal. I enjoy the moment when literature becomes corporeal and non-literary. I, I, I want to draw your, draw your attention to this last phrase. I enjoy the moment when literature becomes corporeal and non-literary. So uh, the, this transition, this uh, illusionary transition, of course, from uh, literature, from the field of discourses to the field of bodies is imagined by Sorokin as the negation of literature. But is it indeed? I don't think so. I think it all happens in the space of literature nevertheless. So he creates this, this uh, explosive uh, tension between the development of literature by negating its discursive power and by replacing it with corporeal imagery, right? Uh, and uh, in my article, I wrote about several types of um, coronalization that Sarokin uses. One of them is direct coronalization, which is indeed corresponding to materialization of verbal metaphors. For example, uh, many of you remember his uh, famous uh, early book, The Norm, uh, which I think is an encyclopedia of uh, late Soviet underground uh, creative uh, devices, right? And uh, I'm looking forward to its to its translation uh, in English, uh, which is which is a challenge for a translator, of course. Um, and uh, uh, as you remember, uh, there are several several parts in this book where metaphors are. Um, transformed into the direct imagery. One of them are uh, titled Verses and Songs, where, where Soviet songs are transformed into the images and uh, uh, golden hands uh, of a boy are melted uh, for the mechanism in the, the clocks, uh, on the, on, on, for the mechanism on the uh, top of the palace of Soviets. And um, the, the heart that the sailor left with the girl sits in the uh, jar and, 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 and pulsates uh, on the table of the police station where, where the girl brings this heart, right? Uh, of course, the 
the central metaphor of this book, the norm, uh, which is which is uh, processed feces that uh, Soviet people have to uh, eat every day and uh, eat in different uh, circumstances, is also a realization of the verbal metaphor that you have to eat a, a load of shit before before you can achieve something. Right. Uh, so it's 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 pretty pretty. Uh, clear and open, uh, but we can see that, that, that Sorokin mm, from time to time uses this, this device in his later work, for instance, uh, in uh, he, his script for the film Moscow 2000. Um, there is an episode when one uh, character is inflating the other character uh, by the outer pump. pump. Right, and as Alexander Genghis noticed that the realization of the uh, idiom uh, about uh, crooks who are uh, cheating each other, один жулик надул другого, right? Uh, here we also see this this metaphor, uh, realization of metaphor, for example, in his uh, 2010 uh, novel or novella, uh, The Blizzard, uh, where uh, the, the verbal um, metaphor uh, from the horsepower as a description of the power of the engine, um, horses, uh, how many horses do you have under hood, are transformed into real little horses who are pulling the sledge. Um, in the Sugar Kremlin 2008, uh, the metaphor of the sweetness uh, of power basically borrowed from the line uh, by Mandelstam is uh, uh, translated into the image of the sugar Kremlin, which each character licks, and to this licking of the sugar Kremlin, as noticed by Miriman Skakov, uh, appears to be the transformation of the norm, the, the processed feces that his characters were consuming in the early process. Now it's sweet and sugarly, but the nature of this process is still the same. Um, I mentioned this already. Um, indirect criminalization is uh, more complicated, right? And uh, uh, it is built on the materialization of the hidden discursive logic, hidden discursive power, something that is not on the surface of the idiom, but has to be unearthed, has to be exposed. And Sorokin uses various means uh, from gibberish to the shocking acts of violence uh, to, to expose the hidden potential of the authoritative discourse. And here, uh, of course, we can see his, his power of uh, uh, the writer who can mimic authoritative discourses so much that we fall under the spell in order to be later shocked by the exposure. And uh, in his first a collection of short stories, the first Subotnik, uh, 1979-84, uh, he, he called it, uh, the text, including this uh, collection, Little Literary Bombs, because uh, the first half of this story, or well, sometimes the three-fourth of the story, um, is, is written in the very, uh, very boring style of the uh, Soviet literature, mediocre Soviet literature from as Sorokin used to say provincial uh, press. It's it's not even social realism. Sometimes it's social realism. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but it is it is some kind of the cultural norm. And then at certain point, this culturally normative uh, narrative about the teacher and uh, school children, about the Komsomol meeting, about the uh, funeral of the old good man, uh, turns into something very very shocking into some kind of a ritual uh, that, that typically, as I said, uh, involves uh, uh, excrements, blood, uh, violence. Uh, and uh, Sorokin quite intentionally wants us uh, to not to feel well while reading these stories. He wants to trigger the semantic reaction. And that's exactly uh, what his criminalization is about. He creates images so uh, powerful on the physiological level that you want to vomit. And Sorokin writes that, that, that vomiting is not that bad. 
uh, a purifying reflux is not necessarily bad. It purifies the organism. Purifies from what? Purifies from the discursive dependencies. Purifies from the um, hyp uh, hypnotic uh, um, dependence on the uh, norm, basically, right? On the normative uh, cultural hegemony, right? And uh, by this means creates certain sense of liberation. Um, I, I would say that, that this very technique, although we um, typically uh, treat Sorokin as one of the leading postmodernist writers, and he is a postmodernist writer, of course, uh, but this very technique uh, harkens back to surrealism, right? And in this respect, Sorokin um, connects uh, Russian postmodernism with uh, surrealism that, that, as we know, didn't develop uh, very well in uh, Russian culture, but uh, Marcel Duchamp appears in his books uh, from time to time as a very important reference, for example, in the norm. Uh, we can see how this mechanism works in his most scandalous novel, uh, Golubboya Sala, The Blue Lord, uh, the novel of, the 19, uh, of 1999, and the novel that, that triggered uh, the uh, aggressive reaction of uh, the pro-government uh, youth uh, organization that was uh, throwing uh, uh, Sorokin's books into the uh, big uh, plastic toilet that they uh, installed uh, next to Bolshoi Theater. Um, and here uh, we have three levels of, of narrative. There is a level of narrative associated with the uh, future and uh, uh, produ production of clones. Uh, there is a level of uh, narrative that is associated with the, some kind of uh, retro utopia, utopia of uh, the, the sack that, that escaped in the depth of the woods and uh, live the pre-modern lifestyle. And then we have uh, the third utopian narrative, the narrative of alternative history in which uh, Hitler and Stalin are um, ruling the world after World War II. Right, so there the, are the, the three utopias, right? Uh, uh, techno futuristic utopia, uh, utopia of uh, conservative uh, reversal of history, and utopia of uh, alternative totalitarianism, right? And they are all connected by the image of the blue lark. The blue lard is a sort of mystical image, uh, but but as we understand from the plot, it it is a byproduct of uh, literary work. Right uh, in the first part, the uh, clones of great writers, great Russian writers, are created, um, and uh, while while writing their text, they they produce this blue lard that uh, scientists uh, accumulate and that that travels across times uh, and uh, across the Um And here comes the fourth level of this um, book, uh, the level of the writings of these authors, which are sometimes hilarious and, and, and uh, um, Sorokin creates his stylization and sort of deconstructions of uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, on the one hand, Chekhov, and uh, Soviet writers uh, uh, in a diapason from, from Simonov to, to Pasternak, right? And many people were very offended by, by this uh, text, but they are incredibly funny and they are incredibly liberating from the um, feeling of the canon, or from the pressure of the canon and pressure of the authority, right? Uh, but uh, certainly there, there is a very important message that all kinds of utopia that, that uh, appear in this territory, they are united, united by this uh, attraction to the blue lard, to the blue lard that, that uh, Alexander Gaines, for example, calls the Russian Graal, right? Uh, it is, it is uh, the substance that uh, is not affected by any external uh, influences, right? It, it's not changing to some kind of the essence of the uh, Russian literature. It's uh, the, 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 the um, warranty of its eternity. So every, every utopia, every uh, wants to build its power upon this uh, mystical force, upon, upon the force of literature, right? However, uh, in all three 
major episodes, we see how this this uh, attempt fails. Right? How how the um, blue lard is being taken away by the competing utopia and passed along, uh, uh, leaving um, basically devastation and destruction behind. Uh, in the end of the novel, and the novel I remind is written in 1999, uh, blue lard is being uh, transformed into commodity um, in the consumerist future. That basically is the future of techno utopia that appears in the in the first part. And blue lard serves as the material for the gown uh, that uh, a young hero puts on for the Easter ball. Right, uh, it 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 is it is the um, downplayment of the myth of great literature. So just a gown, just decoration, just uh, consumer is good, right? But at the same time, the Easter ball suggests, uh, as usual, resurrection. So Sorokin, at one and the same time, undermines literature as uh, the Russian religion and Russian religious power, right? uh, and resurrect it, tries to resurrect it, and I will try to continue this, this idea furthermore. But uh, here in this text, through, through multiple parodies and multiple uh, mockeries, we see how the devastating power of spirituality, so to speak, of Russian literature uh, comes to the front. And that's, that's I think, the, uh, the uh, effect of colonialization because certainly all, uh, and I'm not going into detail, but there are quite, quite graphic and uh, wonderful uh, uh, in their own good, uh, all, all the um, grotesque effects are uh, associated with the body. And uh, one of the most scandalous uh, scenes uh, is the the the, 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 uh, the sexual act between alternative Stalin and alternative Khrushchev, for example. He continues this process of deconstruction of authoritative discourse in his uh, subsequent novel, Raman or novel, and here we, we have to use both words because uh, Raman is the name of the central character, but but uh, novel uh, and the death of the novel is what Sorokin displays there. And here he uh, plays mainly with one style, the style of Russian classical novel, novel continuing the tradition of uh, Turgenev or, or Goncharov. And the uh, first hundred of actually more than hundred pages are very much uh, stylized as the novel of the 19th century, and uh, one would be surprised by the fact that, that uh, it had been written in the end of the 20th century. But of course, uh, the surprise will, will be um, replaced with another surprise when uh, Roman will start killing uh, each and every one uh, in, in the novel. Uh, and uh, in the end, he will kill himself. And uh, the, the last phrase will be that, uh, Raman Umir, the novel is dead or Raman is dead. Uh, the, 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 the ritual of sort of multiple sacrifice is what uh, unfolds in this last pages of the novel. Um, sacrifice that is also blasphemous and again, of course devastating. And uh, this sacrifice uh, reads as a metaphor of revolution or metaphor of the explosive power hidden in the most peaceful uh, forms of Russian literature. Uh, the novel is a bomb that explodes and it explodes right in front of our eyes, uh, along with the Russian cultural tradition. How to interpret this? And we can continue with these uh, examples. I just wanted to give you a few ones. Um, Sarokin himself interpreted this uh, in, in um, quite uh, contradictory manner. So here uh, you can see three quotations uh, from, from Sorokin. Um, in one of them, 1992, uh, he basically uh, assigns corporeal power to the text, to the literary text. And this, uh, I wouldn't even say that it's just corporeal, it's, it's a magic power, right? Text is a powerful weapon. It can hypnotize and sometimes it paralyzes, right? So, so the text can affect your 
mind and can affect your body. The text is, as we would say later, a narcotic. The text is the uh, tool in the hands of a shaman. But at the same time, when, when attacked uh, for, for his uh, brutality and for the um, use of uh, sins of violence and then gore and obscenities, uh, Sorokin routinely responded on paper, one may allow himself to do anything, it will tolerate everything. God's word wasn't on paper, but how does it connect with what he said in 1992? Uh, in a way, uh, he still wants to reproduce the work we, of God's word. He wants to um, reach effects, achieve effects that are beyond the space of paper, that are in the reader's mind and even the reader's body. So Sarokin is, is sort of in between, in between the using of incredible powers of the literary text and negating its uh, uh, effect. Right? And uh, I don't think that he is uh, um, not uh, sincere in, in one of the statements. He combines both. Yes, his text is very playful, but while being very playful, yes, it produces very strong effect on the reader and through the reader, it changes the perspective, right? So um, Sorokin himself uh, compares this work with the work of a sculptor. For me, it's a pure, I immensely enjoy myself by playing with different styles. For me, it's a pure plaster job. Words like clay, I can physically feel how I sculpt the text. When they ask me, how can you torture people like this? I respond, these are not persons, these are just letters on paper. This is 2003, and you see, can see how these two theses come together. On the one hand, words like clay, words are material, words have the substance, right? And on the other hand, they're just not people, they're just letters on paper. Not quite, not quite. So, so the, his, his explanations are contradictory by default, so, so we need to find some others. So one of possible interpretations, um, there are many of them, I should, I should tell in advance, but I will uh, introduce you two of them. Um, one is uh, coming, uh, have been formulated by my, my friend and colleague, Ilya Kalinin, who writes about Sorokin's uh, work as a metalingual utopia. Right? And uh, Ilya thinks that, that Sorokin's text are all this about a victor of language in a non representational mode. What does he mean? He means that Sorokin tries to transcend language as it had been historically shaped, language as the reflection of the reality. He wants to turn language into the reality. He wants to sculpt language as real. Thing, right? Uh, by this means, he, he basically reinvents, reinvents the language. He, he escapes from history. He tries to create some kind of the language before signification, language that, that is the thing that it refers to. Surprisingly enough, that this, this um, desire, this interpretation, um, corresponds to the famous definition of uh, estrangement or defamiliarization or astranenia by Viktor Shklovsky, who uh, wrote uh, that, that, that the, the, the point of uh, astranenia is to make uh, stone stony, right? So it's to, re to, to, to return the feeling to things. And Ilya Kalinin is one of the leading experts in Shklovsky, um, definitely knows this explanation and definitely uses it. However, uh, for, for Shklovsky, that wasn't an escape from history. For Sorokin, it is. It is. It is an escape from, into a different history, alternative history. History that doesn't remember itself, according to Ilya. I, I, I love this uh, theory, uh, but, but I um, can find multiple mm. counter arguments against it. And uh, uh, the fact that, that Sorokin constantly changes his style in relation to the changing context, right? Uh, moving from uh, Soviet style to 
classical literature and classical canon, and then to this uh, new forms of archaization that we can see in uh, the day of Aprichnik, and then to the uh, language of today's media, as we can see in his uh, latest works, first of all, in the white square, suggests that he is not escaping history, that he is exploring history. However, um, there is something that 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 um, goes beyond the deconstruction, beyond the satire. It's uh, exactly as he said, the his enjoyment uh, uh, from uh, playing with words, right? His enjoyment of uh, demiurge, right? He calls himself uh, a stylistic Protean, and uh, I would I would uh, define uh, this this tendency as Protean vitalism because uh, Sorokin surprisingly. Uh, is trying to revitalize everything that he touches upon. Uh, and uh, the main principle of this revitalization is indeed colonialization that produces embodiment, right? Abstract categories are becoming vital. They are filled with two main uh, energies, either erotic or abject, but both of them are can cannot leave you indifferent. They are starting to live their own life, right? At the same time, we, we can feel the pleasure of mimicry and the pleasure of metamorphosis that the invisible author experiences. And of course, Sorokin is an um, author who um, dons multiple masks, but we always can feel when he enjoys the, the stylistic mask that he is wearing, right? Um, so by this pretend, protean vitalism, he replaces the deadly force of abstractions with affects, right? He is creating the style or method of writing uh, based uh, directly on manipulations of affects. We can say that every writer manipulates affects, but, but uh, Sorokin tries to streamline this, this manipulation and uh, tries to create some uh, American or Russian uh, heals uh, uh, by by moving from very abstract categories to very uh, strong affects uh, that uh, that they produce, and uh, this uh, protean vitalism explain why throughout his entire work uh, we can see the the development of uh, motifs associated with food and violence, and uh, in 1999 uh, in the blue light appears the motif of drugs then. Uh, which, which then remains in his in his writings. Um, so it's 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 more or less logical, if not the contradictions, contradictions that uh, are becoming more and more obvious in his works of the 21st century. The paradox here is that on the one hand, as as I showed in my examples, with my examples, Sorokin continues to use the same. Um, arsenal of devices of criminalization. But at the same time, he creates a number of uh, contradictory devices, a number of contradictory effects associated with, with, with criminalization, right? So a few, a few examples. For example, um, in his early work, The 30th uh, Love of Marina, Marina's 30th Love, written in the early uh, 80s, it appears something that we may call uh, the reverse of colonization, and which I suggest to call disembodiment, right? The, the, uh, the, transition, the transition from corporeal to non-corporeal, from corporeal to discursive, right? And uh, we see it in the, in the plot development, right? When, when the uh, central character, protagonist, uh, Marina, a free spirit living in the uh, late Brezhnev's Moscow, uh, falls in love with the uh, partorg of some factory who looks uh, as a spitting image of uh, Solzhenitsyn at the same time, right? Uh, and uh, for the first time, she experiences orgasm with him. But after this, we see this, this, this transformation of Marina and uh, the text about her, which, which uh, pretty soon slides into the long uh, official discourse, very much uh, um, reminiscent of uh, those 
uh, most boring and uh, sort of uh, absolutely meaningless articles uh, published in the Soviet press, published by Pravda. Uh, and uh, so, so the, the discourse reflects the transformation of Marina, who becomes the poster, so, uh, poster girl of socialist realism and absolutely in, uh, becomes invisible. So she disappears in front of our eyes. Her body disappears. She's completely absorbed by this uh, stream of uh, senseless discourse. So, so the, 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 this is basically here it was the, um, at least in my reading, uh, the transformation of the person affected by the dead ideology, by the dead letter of ideology, right? Um, and uh, we can see similar disembodiments in other works of, of, of Sorokin, but uh, when we read his uh, Eyes trilogy, um, we see this process and it's very much it's very much similar, right? And uh, especially uh, when uh, the characters undergo their their transition into the um, brothers uh, of light, and when when they sort of discover that they belong to the chosen sacred number of twenty three thousand, uh, their their corporeality uh, fades away. They they they, they spend time uh, in the exalted exalted state of mind but but uh, uh, completely asexualized right uh, and uh, Sorokin reproduces this trans transformation here with the very ambivalent uh, or if not very positive uh, coloring as a, indeed the story of people who uh, go against meat machines right so for him, uh, for him, uh, the, the the existence different from the existence of these brothers of life is defined not for him, for his characters. I will correct myself. Is defined as a life of meat machines, as the life uh, that, that that sort of doesn't doesn't deserve uh, compassion or even slightest interest. Right? Uh, we may call that this position is. We may say that this position is very, very far from humanism, but uh, Sorokin never, never declared to be a humanist. However, it is, it is, it is some strange twist in Sorokin's work, right, where he um, explored the um, totalitarian uh, ideology. I would say totalitarian, racist ideology. Uh, and uh, explored uh, with with all uh, his mimetic power, he sort of was was absorbed into it, and uh, uh, it took time before he could step back from it. And uh, I think that that uh, um, the day of their preaching that followed uh, the last novel uh, of the trilogy is the response to to this ideology is the the sort of uh, the realization of uh, a similar ideology in the in, in, in practical ways of Russian history. However, the day of their preaching is more uh, complicated than it seems to be because it um, displays a number of contradictions. Um, for instance, as, as those of you who read it, remember that uh, there are multiple violent uh, scenes of uh, violent sex and sadistic violence that are um, addressed against outsiders and that serve for the unity of a preaching, including rape, including murder, right? And by this means, the collective body of the preaching is shaped. But at the same time, we can see that the very same, same uh, violent acts are used for individual pleasure, although they are defined in this case as crimes in, in the case of Count Urusov. We, we see um, in the first uh, scene the combination of uh, rape and uh, arsony uh, fire during the pogrom that the Prichniki uh, do towards the um, towards the state official who had been uh, under repression, and then we learn about uh, similar entertainments of the Count Rusev. At one station, it forms collective body. At another station, it is the uh, unforgivable crime for which Rusev is is killed at the end of the novel. Uh, 
collective transgressions, and there are many of them from, from drugs to in violence uh, and, and corruption, of course, they manifest the sacredness of power. Right, uh, Aprishniks belong to, to, to power which is outside of the laws they are supposed to uh, defend and promote, and therefore they can do what others can, right? Uh, but also, also these acts uh, of um, transgression, especially when, when it comes to drugs, they manifest freedom, and we cannot uh, ignore this as well. So violence here appears as the most effective manifestation of this freedom, sacred power taken together, right? And uh, I, I find very, very informative, uh, very, very illuminating, uh, the illustration by Raslav Schwarzstein, who imitates uh, the structure of the orthodox icon uh, with its labels on the perimeter. And that reflects the, the, the actually the narrative in this scene and scene of prayer in the uh, Cathedral of Dormition, when um, the central character prays to, to God, prays to power, and recollect the acts of violence. They are interconnected, but they are also interconnected with the freedom. The same can be said about the discourse of corporeality. On the one hand, uh, 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 Kamiaga is very much angry about his colleagues uh, reading um, obscene fairy tales from a massive collection. So he's against the carnalization. And on the other hand, we, we see at least two scenes where colonization serves to the unity of the collective body of Aprishina, the sin of caterpillar, and the sin of drilling of the feet. Right. Um, also uh, with the drugs, uh, the, the use of drugs in this and later novels, uh, later texts of, of Sorokin is quite paradoxical, right? Um, very much like um, the glue lard uh, where drugs are legalized. Uh, many drugs are legalized in the day of Aprishnik, right? And uh, uh, Sarokin himself says that before the revolution, cocaine was sold in Russian pharmacies in the new Russian state in the blue lard and the day of Aprishnik. This is a compensation for the Iron Curtain. We deprive you of the West, that forbidden fruit, uh, but we are giving you this instead. You don't need any West, go to a pharmacy and buy cocaine. Uh, you will be happy, and in the West, all this is forbidden. So here in this description, drugs appear as the surrogate freedom. But read his uh, own confession. I'm engaged in literature because since my childhood was addicted to this drug. I'm a literary addict like you, but I also can cook these drugs, which not everyone can do. Uh, and we see how, how the use of the so-called little fish uh, in the Aprishnika uh, leads to the production of the collective dream which uh, Sarokin describes in the um, style of uh, Russian Bulin, of uh, style of the epic uh, tale, right? Uh, in uh, the novella Mikhail Blizzard, the Blizzard, uh, drugs are appearing as very complicated um, portals into the land of imagination, right? And uh, since uh, this entire text is uh, built on references to Russian 19th century literature and uh, specifically to, to Tolstoy, uh, we, we, we realize when we read uh, how Dr. Garin consumes this pyramid, you can see the pyramid on the, uh, on the Russian cover, uh, how he uh, lives through the emotions and uh, uh, dynamics that, that the literary text suggests. The literary text is very similar to the one that Sorokin's write. It's very much meta, metafictional and outer reflective. So, so drugs indeed function as literature. Furthermore, in uh, Sorokin's um, probably most uh, um, ambitious novel, Teluria, 2013, he describes uh, the world uh, after the end of the world, right? So he describes uh, Eurasia uh, and uh, mainly Russia uh, that broke into multiple uh, microstates. 
uh, there are 50 chapters and uh, there are less than 50, but, but about this number of states that each of them depicts. And these states uh, all um, experience a different linguistic regime, right? They, they all use different um, discourses, right? Um, but what unites them is the power of Tellurian Tellurian nail that that has to be hammered into uh, the head uh, by uh, an experienced uh, operator who is called the the blacksmith. But, but the effect of this nail is the effect of literature, is the effect of art. You are experiencing something as if you are there. Right? You 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 are living through the imaginary world with all fullness of uh, um, feelings and uh, suffering and joy, etc. And uh, at a certain point, uh, the, one of Sorokin's characters finds uh, himself next to Jesus Christ. Uh, Sorokin goes as far. Right? And uh, from this perspective, we understand that, 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 that uh, he blurs the borderline between dystopia and utopia that his Telluria, his world united by Tellurian uh, nails is the world post-apocalyptic, yes, indeed. But at the same time, it is the world of happiness. And one of the characters says, you know, what the power of Tellurium is about, it agitates in our brain most intimate desires, most valuable dreams. But dreams that have been thought through deep, profound, as opposed to impulsive pangs. All known narcotic substances drive us behind, forcing on us their desires, their will, and their ideas of pleasure. But tellurium, divine tellurium, offers neither euphoria, nor a spasm of pleasure, nor a rainbow colored high. Tellurium offers you a whole world, solid, truthful, and life. And uh, this description is basically a uh, sort of um, going against colonization because it is it is the drug, it is the substance that creates the world. It's not the it's it's what literature does. It, uh, it works only in the out reflective way, but but uh, not uh, in the usual way at all. Uh, in Manaraga, um, Thurkin goes even further right? because this is the novel. Um, the main premise of which is that uh, books are being used for cooking. And its narrator is the real chef who, who cooks uh, different dishes using different uh, books. And, and uh, Sorokin, of course, uses his uh, brilliant uh, talent of the uh, style mimic to, to describe uh, the scenes that this cooking produce cooking uh, episode, episodes produced, right, in, in connection with the text that being cooked, right? However, however, um, the, the plot of this novel uh, pushes us towards the realization that, that the books are burned, not because they're not valued, not at all. The books are burned because they're valued as the sacred object, because they have to be sacrifice, right? And uh, that's where the process of destruction turns into the process of construction, construction of the new sacred uh, that is being um, built uh, on the ruins of culture because because uh, sort of uh, on a timeline, the action of Manraga happens even after Tiluri, it's even later in the future. Right, and uh, the only danger that, that, that Sorokin sees there is the um, moving away from singularity of this sacrifice, transforming this into a commercial enterprise where the clones of books are being burned by thousands in industrial, industrial um, ovens, right? So, so uh, the destruction of literature produces the sacred, but uh, its uh, antipode is associated with cloning. Uh, and clones appear in, in uh, Sorokin's works uh, 
very frequently. We can see them in the uh, screen for the film. For the film, the first film of Ilya Krasinovsky, now famous by his doll, we can see it in the, the Blue Lord, right? We can see it in the Rosenthal children. And uh, clones are um, horrible, clones are meaningless, but clones are very much corporeal, right? So, so, so uh, clones are corporeality that, that doesn't liberate, isn't it? Yet at the same time, these very clones can produce music, can produce literature. Uh, and can uh, produce uh, values that are more than than corporeal. So, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that that um, Sorokin is accumulating contradictions in his uh, later narratives, and uh, my understanding is that these contradictions are all gravitating towards the theme of the new sacred. Right, and in this respect, Sorokin is similar to George Agamben, who argues that modern society doesn't abolish sacred life, but rather shatters it and disseminates it into every individual body, making it into what at stake in political conflict. So Sorokin um, like, uh, looks for various manifestations of the sacred that he detects in the um, unforeseen areas, in the areas that we rather um, qualify as blasphemous or destructive, but uh, but he uh, constantly says the dialectics of the destruction and creation of blasphemy and uh, faith into into the sacred. Right, uh, and uh, to to sum up, uh, Dirk Kufelman ends his book uh, by calling uh, Sorokin classic in his own lifetime, and indeed he is he is already a classic at at, at, at sixty five, a classic that that created an absolutely new type of writing, right? And uh, um, he is in certain way uh, similar to Prigov, uh, and uh, no wonder because he, Prigov was one of the first uh, writers who, who noticed Sorokin and approved what he was doing. And uh, so basically Prigov is his literary father. Uh, Prigov, as we know, uh, also created an individual style by not having an individual style. And it, it's a paradox that is very close to Sorokin. As um, Evgeny Bundman once noticed about Prigov, so you are saying that you are writing in, in, in somebody else's language, but uh, from the very first line of any of your poem, one would say that is Prigov. We, say, we can say the very same thing about Sorokin. Although he is constantly using somebody else's languages, uh, the one who read Sorokin would immediately recognize his pen, right? And uh, that is a new kind of authenticity, authenticity of collage and authenticity of mosaics, authenticity of manipulation with existing cultural language. Uh, Sorokin um, is uh, also, uh, his, his, his place and role in literature and in culture in general uh, can be seen through the comparison with Pinevin. And uh, uh, I, I even have a theory that, that uh, the old dichotomy of uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky uh, is now translated into a dichotomy of Sorokin uh, and Pinevin. Of course, it's half joking that I'm not <coughs> trying to to put an equation uh, sign between them, but uh, we, we all know that, that, that that's one of those foundational dichotomies in Russian uh, cultural imagination. Those who like Tolstoy typically are not big fans of Dostoevsky and vice versa. The same can be said about Sorokin. And uh, in, in, in this dichotomy of Sorokin Pilevin, we can now uh, recognize a very similar a position of skepticism versus faith in the healthy foundations of life, um, exaltation uh, versus uh, mundane but still beautiful vitality, and and I think that that the latter characteristics are uh, more fitting for Sorokin and the former for Pilevin. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, looking at Sorokin, like Sorokin's path, we can see that he a rise to the reinvention of utopia. He uh, and his entire cohort of conceptualists uh, were beginning from 
the dismantling of utopia, first of all, Soviet utopia. And utopia in um, conceptualist um, discourse was uh, treated as the source of violence, right? But now we can see that Sorokin more and more consistently tries to create utopia beyond ideological discourses. Utopia, which is associated with vitalism, right, which is associated with the uh, power of literature that, that uh, is not ruled by ideas, but ruled by, by its sort of plastic, uh, plastic potential, right? Uh, but uh, this power of utopia is also associated with the sacred. Utopia and the sacred in, in Sorokin's world are becoming very close to each other. Uh, and uh, he constantly plays out the ritual of destruction of, of literature. But uh, each of these destructions uh, eventually produce the effect of rebirth of literature and rebirth uh, of respect to, to its power. In Manaraga, it's just, just, just uh, very visible, but he does this everywhere. Literature is rejected in order to be reborn. And in this uh, respect, he is not only surrealist, he is uh, not only an heir to surrealism, but also an heir to symbolism. He transforms literature into the uh, ritual, ritual that is out referential ritual that is uh, constantly renewing its own medium. And for this, we should be thankful to Vladimir Georgievich Sarokin. Uh, thank you very much.